Welcome, everyone, to our daily broadcast on Kabbalah for Heretics. Good to see you all this morning. Before uh, I get started on the subject uh, of today, which will be the uh, Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, I just want to say something uh, to be clearer about what I refer to very often in passing. I say repeatedly and, and, and say it again that in our Dunlo West teaching, we have gone from a, cl a class mode to a broadcast mode. I, I, all of you know that previously what we did was we had a class every morning at a, at a set time and people would come and, and listen and learn and, and then we would post that talk on Facebook and so forth. For a whole lot of reasons, all of which I'm very grateful for, we went from that to a broadcast mode. This is not a class that people are encouraged to attend, not at all. Right now, for example, there, there are just two, uh, two people other than myself who are doing the recording and who will be posting that recording uh, as a broadcast on our Dunmore West YouTube channel. We have a, we've set up a special YouTube channel. And by the way, our success at that is just, to me, astounding and uh, really speaks to the wisdom of having gone to this new modality. I mean, it's, it's only been about two months now since we went from the class to the broadcast mode, and we already have well over 2,000 listeners. We have an audience of almost 3,000 listeners. That's amazing. That's, that's so much broader than anything we were doing in the previous mode. And that continues to increase weekly by anywhere from 15 to 25 percent. It keeps increasing every week. But there, there's one glitch in that that I want to talk about, not all morning, but I just want to mention it for those of you in the listening audience. I frequently say, that in order to truly know a spiritual teaching, you must sit with a teacher who has been initiated into that teaching himself, who personally, face-to-face, -face, as it were, transmits it to you. Well, that does not include listening to a broadcast. It doesn't include going to a, a, a lecture where thousands of people are there listening to a teacher teach. It doesn't include that. The class mode that we had did afford an opportunity to people who really wanted to, to be a student of mine to do so. I hope I'm being clear. And it's important to continue that option. And, and the way that that can continue, even in this shotgun approach of, of a broadcast is that those of you who are really, really serious about learning neo-Sabbateanism from me, not from your own ego, not from yourself, but from me directly, even so far as to be given a Hebrew name by me, those of you who are interested in that can attend these recording sessions as if they were classes. And one or two people still do that. There's, there's someone here now uh, sitting in on the recording session who has been attending these sessions every day, practically, since we began 30 years ago or so. So it's not that people are forbidden to come to these recording sessions. 
what I'm saying is that the only reason you should want to or even do is if you are very, very serious about learning directly from me, person to person, what it is I've come to teach. If that's so, then in addition to listening to the broadcasts on uh, Internet radio, attend these recording sessions where you can talk to me and interact with me personally. That's not required. I want you to listen to me. These sessions are intentionally very small, very informal. They are primarily recording sessions, as, as is being done right now, of, of our broadcast to be put up as a broadcast on our uh, YouTube channel. They're primarily that. But, again, as I've said several times already, if any of you out there in the listening audience want to go deeper than that, and I mean really do want to, not think, oh, it might be a good idea, maybe I'll try it. No. No, if you know you want to go deeper than that with me, then I would encourage you to attend on a regular basis these recording sessions. And regularly. Because they give you an opportunity to, to sit face to face with the teacher, as it were, as is done in any sacred transmission. You're not in the transmission if you read the teacher's books. You're not in the transmission if you listen to his broadcasts. You're not in the transmission if you... Um, attend his lectures, none of that. You're only in the transmission when you sit with him face to face, absorbing his teachings as he teaches them, not as you want to hear them. Now, there are not many who, who really, if they are honest with themselves, want to do that. If you do, then by all means, begin attending these recording sessions of the broadcast on a daily basis. But I'll tell you, there are some requirements in my mind for that. If you decided the day, after, the day before yesterday that you suddenly want to try it out and, and come to uh, these recording sessions to be uh, in close proximity to the teacher, that's not good enough. I require that in order to be a student of mine. Some might say disciple. I hate to use that word because it sounds so arrogant. But if you want to be a disciple, then you have to have been listening to these broadcasts for at least a year. I hope you all hear me. For at least a year. Preferably two years. You have to Make a commitment to coming every morning and to listen quietly to me as I give the talk or as the Holy Spirit gives the talk. And then, as we do at the end of the broadcast, I ask for comments, questions, interaction, and so forth, and you can participate in that then. But you must have been studying with me, listening carefully to everything I've said here, reading most of what I've written. Now, I'm not kidding. If you want to be a, quote, disciple, unquote, if you want to pass on the Neo-Sabbatean transmission, then this is what I require for you to come and sit with me, by me. It's interesting that both Kabbalah, the word Kabbalah in Hebrew, and Upanishads in Sanskrit mean sit by me, because that's how it's transmitted. Now, that doesn't mean to say you can't just drop in every now and then if you want to. Yes, of course. You can dr just drop in. But don't, but don't, if that's all you're doing, don't consider yourself to be a, quote, disciple, unquote. You're just dropping into a recording session, and that's fine.
in my experience over the last 40 some years as a teacher I've come to the conclusion that it is really more important to keep people out than to grab them and drag them in. And I suppose that's just part and parcel of my Judaic background, my rabbinic background, um, because that's exactly the way it is with a convert. If a Gentile comes to a rabbi, a real rabbi, to convert to Judaism, the rabbi sends him away, and he sends him away three times. If he comes back the third time, then he says, all right, you may be a student of mine. You may come here every week or whatever. It's important to keep people out. Now, you may not agree with that, but you don't know what I'm talking about from an aspect of the teaching. Everyone is totally welcome and encouraged to listen to all these broadcasts and to read everything I've written, of course. And occasionally, if they want to, informally attend these recording sessions with no commitment toward becoming a, quote, disciple, unquote. But if you want to be a, quote, disciple, unquote, if you eventually would hope when I'm gone to carry on my work, because that's the point, then there are requirements that you must fulfill for me. And I've gone over them, and I hope you've heard them. It doesn't mean you have to. And I've set those up over the years, more particularly now, to keep people away than to drag them close. I am not interested in large numbers. Of course, it, it's nice to have a large number, but that's a primary interest. I just want to make that uh, clear to those of you listening this morning. I know that I've kind of mentioned that in a way uh, several times in the past, but I thought I would really clarify it now. Again, we do not count our success, as it were by the number of people sitting right here, right now, listening to me. Being right here in this recording session. That's not... I count the success by the number and the listening audience out there. And even that, you know, is not the full definition of success. Do either of the two of you who are here have a question about that? Because sometimes the one or two people who are here have a question that is on the mind of a lot of people in the listening audience. All right, that's fine. Then, if you're interested in just dropping in every now and then to the recording sessions, that's just fine. Try to be here on time, mind your manners, and so forth. Um, it's informal, and you don't need to give advance notice or anything like that. On the other hand, if you want to do that in order to be in training to carry on my work when I am gone, you must become, as it were, a disciple of ours in the way I've described it, which is to have studied intensely my written and spoken word for at least a year. Intensely. Preferably two years. And you must attend the recording sessions regularly. There's no charge for this. As with any true teacher, I do not charge a penny for anything. God provides for me through my students who feel uh, sometimes encouraged to send the gift. That's, they don't, you do not have to. Not at all. What I provide to those who are wanting to study with, to carry on my work when I leave, 
the world, there's no charge ever. The recording sessions are every day, every morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Time. We record on Paltalk and broadcast on YouTube. So you're invited to come. If, if you want, either because you find it interesting to attend every now and then, and that's fine, or because you want to become a serious student. You see, if, if you were here as a serious student, I would ask, as I'm doing now, do, does anybody have a comment or a question about what I've just said? Raise your hand if you do. And at this moment, the one or two people who are here don't have a comment or question. But if you were here, you might. And that is a way of establishing this personal face-to-face -face relationship with the teacher. Well, let's move on to the subject of this morning. Let's move on to the subject of this morning, which is the Gnostic Gospels of the Nag Hammadi Library. Every other morning for the past 25 years, every single morning, we have been studying the Zohar, volume to volume, volume to volume, cover to cover, paragraph by paragraph, sentence by sentence, on what is the Sunday and Saturday, we devote our time to other highly related issues. Principally now, on this day, the Gnostic Gospels. Because as you would know, if you've been listening and learning with me, there is a tremendous influence of the oral Torah of Judaism on early Christian Gnosticism. It is a relationship that the Gnostic Gospels acknowledge and are thankful for. There's one Gnostic Gospel that says we are indebted to our Jewish, our, is, our Israelite brothers who have come in to be among us and have brought their wisdom and their gnosis in for us to understand. They do. A very bold statement of appreciation. There were Jews in the early Gnostic movement because it was not like the Christian church movement, if you understand what I mean. That's why when, uh, <laughs> when Martin Buber accused Gershom Sholem and Kabbalah of merely being an, a form of Gnosticism, which he did, I laugh because indeed it is. It's pre-Christian. <laughs> but was brought into the Christian Gnosticism by the Jew, who became, as it were, a Christian Gnostic. Because to be a Gnostic then, as now, does not require you to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It does not. And it is not involved with the ideas of sin and redemption. So you could be a Buddhist or a Jew or a Zen monk or anything and be a Gnostic back then. You were not betraying any of your previous beliefs. But that was when it was pure Gnosticism. Gradually it became contaminated by churchism. And I know that all the Christians love to say, we are not a religion. We are not a religion. We are a personal relationship to God. Well, yes, some of you are. But you're also a damn religion. You tell people what they should and should not do. You tell people how they should do it. You tell them they're wrong if they don't. You tell them they're damned if they don't. That's a religion. <laughs> Nobody in Gnosticism, I don't think, has ever said, you're damned if you don't accept Jesus. Because that's not really essential. The man Jesus 
the person of Jesus is irrelevant. He was a flesh bag, like any other, but one that carried with it, by the grace of God, the fully redeemed, fully exposed Holy Spirit with the intention of awakening it in others. So that they also may participate in the kind of deep relationship with God that Jesus had. Jesus says in the Gospel of, um, of John, he says, Father, I have taught them your name so that they may have the same kind of relationship with you as I have with you. That's not what church Christianity teaches. The goal in church Christianity is not to become the same as Jesus. On the contrary, that would be considered blasphemous. But it is according to Gnosticism and even to the New Testament itself. Also in the New Testament, Jesus says again in John, I must leave you. I've told you I must leave you because if I don't leave you, then you cannot receive the Holy Spirit that I have received. And indeed, when I go, I will send her to you. And you will do everything I have done and more. Very little room for reconciliation between church Christianity and, uh, and Gnosticism. We left off last time with uh, Statement 22 of the Gospel of Thomas, which we're currently going through. We've gone through it many times before, but the margins of my copy are just absolutely crawling with scribbles. In uh, Statement 24, he says, uh, um, or Statement 23, listen, concerning what I just said, Jesus said to them, I shall choose you one out of a thousand and two out of ten thousand, and they shall stand as a single one. I shall choose you. Many are called, but few are chosen. Just because you feel called, just because you've listened to every lecture I've given, just because you've read everything I've written, does not make you one of those whom I have chosen to follow me. Not because I'm God, not because I'm the Messiah, but because I'm a teacher. A teacher anointed by God. And sent to holy teachers to learn them what I teach you now through the Holy Spirit. And Jesus also says, no, pardon me, his disciples say to him, show us the place where you are, since it is necessary for us to seek it. Now listen to me. Listen to what they, the, the man Jesus is standing right in front of these disciples, all of whom, by the way, are Jews. And they say to, they say to the man, show us the place you are. For it is necessary for us to seek it. Now listen to that. What person in their right mind would say to a person standing right in front of them, show, show me where you are. You are already showing me where you are by being right in front of me. They're not talking to the man Jesus. They're talking to the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. In him, speaking through him, but not by him, or of him, but of God. It is to her that they are speaking. They're, right, they're brushing right past the man Jesus standing in front of them. Obviously, by the way they say, show us the place you are. They're clearly not talking to the man Jesus, but they're talking to the Holy Spirit of God, hoping, as they say, that necessary for us to seek it. Notice that. Listen to that. It is necessary for us to seek it. It does not say it's necessary for us to find it. 
it is necessary to seek it. Whether you find it or not depends upon whether you are one of the thousand who is chosen. But it is necessary to seek it. Not all of those who seek will find. Not in this lifetime. Perhaps in the next lifetime. Which is why they'll be reincarnated into a next lifetime. To take advantage of what they've learned in this lifetime and apply it to their seeking in the next lifetime. One in a thousand, two in ten thousand are chosen. From among whom? From among those who seek. The New Testament says many are called, but few are chosen. And that's true. When is it that the Holy Spirit can and will choose that one out of a thousand to be her follower, to be her preacher, her teacher, her voice in the world? When that person has successfully gotten past their own ego, and believe me, that's a struggle that is almost insurmountable. Thank God it is surmountable. But it takes enormous work over a long period of time with a master who can see your ego so clearly because his master taught him to see his own ego so clearly. I make no bones about it. I confess my ego. I've got an ego that is probably twice the size of any of you here or anybody listening. I don't pretend that I don't. I don't try to not have it. I try to ripen it, as Sri Ramakrishna said. There are two forms of the ego, the unripened, which is where most people are, and the ripened ego. Only those who have ripened their ego in the presence of a master will be one of the, ten, one of the thousand chosen. One must get past the ego. Right now, at this very moment, stop, everyone, and listen to yourself. Look at yourself. Examine yourself right closely. Look at what you're doing right now. I venture to say your ego is going crazy. Who the hell is this old fart to tell me this, that, 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 that. He doesn't know me. I know as much as he knows. Listen to yourself. I'll bet you. Not all of you, but a good number of you. That's going on right now. And it is proof positive of what I'm teaching. Until you get past that ego, you will never know God. You will never be one who is chosen to be his voice and her voice. Never. I'm not saying you have to be one who destroys your ego. That's nonsense. That's an ego position in the first place. The ego sets up something so impossible in order for you not to do it so it doesn't have to lose. So, it's a, so the ego says to you, oh, you must destroy the ego in order to move on to become one of the 10,000 who are chosen. No. <laughs> That's ego. You must listen to the ego and learn to sort out what is ego of the ripened kind from ego that is unripened. You must learn to sort out what the unripened ego is leading you toward and telling you from what the ripened ego is leading you toward and telling you. Even the Upanishads talk about ego Transcending ego by ego. You hear? Not by destroying the ego. But by truly understanding it. By truly seeing it when it's functioning. Because it's right there and it's working its ways in there unknown to you. And you have to become known. It's working its ways unknown to you. And holding you back from getting where it is you're seeking as it says here in the text. The first task 
is to make you aware that your ego is in there working its ass off to prevent you from finding what it is you naturally are seeking. Because if you do, it will no longer exist in its powerful form for you. Once you find what it is you're seeking, it is so great, much greater than the ego, that the ego is, is really unessential, and it does not want that to happen. It does not want to, in, in effect, die. So it tells you all kinds of bullshit. It'll even set up in you that disgusting false modesty. Oh, I don't have an ego. I do not have an ego. You have an ego. I do not have an ego. That's the ego right there. The proof that it's ego is that it turns around and tells you you do have ego. And when it says to you, you've got to be more modest. I'm a modest man. I'm a humble man. I've conquered my ego. You must conquer yours. That second part of the statement demonstrates how you have not come into contact with the ego. It's still working its way in you, making you judgmental, telling you it has accomplished what you have not, what, the, what your friend has not. Yes, you'll say, yes, all I can tell you is you've achieved a great a great deal more yet to achieve. Who, who the hell can such a thing? The person saying it thinks they're being very modest. And if you ask them, they'll say, no, I, I really have come to terms with my ego. Because they're blind to their ego. So the first step is to acknowledge it as uncomfortable as that is, because it is fiercely uncomfortable. And the ego will fight it tooth and nail at the beginning. The teacher has got to be willing, regardless of what the student's reaction will be, to continually confront their ego at the moment it is demonstrating itself. And the student is obligated to hear what the teacher is saying not judging it, not evaluating it well. I know I'll weigh what you said. I'll weigh what you said and see if, if I find that acceptable. That's not the reaction. Neither is it, oh, you're right, I'm wrong. No. The reaction is, I hear you. I'm listening to what you're saying, not to what I'm thinking. It's nothing to do with accepting or rejecting it has nothing to do with believing or not believing. It has to do with shutting the fuck up and listening. Now, that's not very satisfactory to New Age woos. They want to jump right into the river of life and get all washed and cleaned by it just by sticking a toe in. No, that's not how it works. It's never worked that way. And it doesn't work that way now. So Jesus says right here in the Gospel of Thomas, I shall choose you one out of a thousand and two out of ten thousand. And on what basis will you be chosen if you are? On the basis of having come to terms with your ego, of being willing to take this enormous risk of acknowledging it in yourself, of watching it at the very moment it's working, not rejecting it while it's working, but observing it, understanding it. That's how the one in a thousand is chosen. Right now, every one of you, there are almost 3,000 in our listening audience now, every one of you is being judged on that basis. Not by me, but by the Holy Spirit. It's, looking, it's peeking around all of you. Is this person listening or not? Is that, no, this person is not listening. The ego is telling this. This person is functioning out of his ego. He's listening through his ego. He's not listening through his ears. So at that moment, you're not one of those chosen by the Holy Spirit. Right now. 
to those of you who are uh, the listening audience who are just not accepting what I'm saying, not agreeing with what I'm saying, no, who are just listening to it for God's sake, without inner commentary, you are among the thousand that the Holy Spirit will choose. Not because you're agreeing with what is being said here, but because you're just listening to it without judgment and without ego. He said to them, listen, whoever has ears, let him hear. Those are the ones who are chosen from the thousand and among the ten thousand. Those who have ears and use them to hear what is being said, not what is being thought by them. They are the ones closest to being among the chosen. God chooses those whom it will allow to come close to it and in whom it will take up habitation. Jung says regarding this, for example, Jung says, God does not seek to incarnate in the Holy One, in the pious one, but rather God seeks to incarnate in the dark one, in the bad one, in the impious, the unholy, because in anything else, the dark God would find no room. It's not because that ego is agreeing with the Holy Spirit, not at first. It's because it has ears to hear and it's using them to hear, not to judge. It's very difficult to truly understand. Many of you out there are saying, oh, I know, yes, yes, I agree with that, I know that, and you don't. The ego is telling you you do, so you don't have to do it. If you already know something, what use is there in doing it? Again. Yeah, that's the ego trick, one of the many. So he said to them, whoever has ears, let him hear. There is light within a man of light. And he lights up the whole world. If he does not shine, it is because he is in darkness. <laughs> That's how the Holy Spirit knows whether you are one in whom it will inhabit and who will inhabit in it. They're easy enough. You can see whether a light is turned on or turned off. If I'm at the door of a room and the light is off, I ain't going to go in the room. If I'm standing at the door and I want to get in the room and the light is already on, I'm much more likely to go into it. There's light within a man of light. That's the one in a thousand that the Holy Spirit will choose. The one in whom there is a light that is visible. Now I might mention to you that that light in, a, in, a, in a, a man or a woman is not visible to the ego of the other. In fact, the ego of the other will deny it. You think you're so important, but you've got a long way to go, buddy. That's the ego refusing to see the light but if it shuts the hell up and truly listens it, it sees the light that is within that person never forget when I lived in Sausalito and was very heavily in the first stages of my spiritual uh, path one of my very closest friends was very heavily into it also and I must confess that, that I, I was high because we were using pot and acid, although I never took acid. We were using pot as a spiritual tool, not just to have a good time and get off. And another friend and I were walking down the street together 
nicely high, and this Peter friend came walking toward me, and I was almost blown out of space. The light that was pouring out of him was astonishing. I had never seen that in anyone, let alone him. There's light in a man of light, and indeed, he was a man of light. There's no question in my mind. And a teacher for me. He said to them, whoever has ears, let him hear. There's light within a man of light. And therefore he or she lights up the whole world. But there are those in whom there is no light. And that is the person who is in darkness and there is no light. It does not shine. And then speaking to the ego directly, and this, this is one of the sayings from Gospel of Thomas that it was picked up by the evangelists and used in the later New Testament. He said, you see the moat in your brother's eye, but you do not see the beam in your own. When you cast the beam out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to cast the moat from your brother's eye. Until you see the ego in your eye and cast it out from your eye, you cannot and will not see it in another's eye. Now, if that's not what I've been teaching all this morning, I don't know what is. Here, directly, from the mouth of Jesus Christ, at the time he said it, written down by Didymus Thomas while it was being said. Well, I'll stop here for this morning. Let me mark my place. We'll pick up with that. In the meantime, of course, the program has ended. The broadcast is over. Let me do now at the conclusion what I've been doing at the conclusion of every class and will continue to be doing for the next year, and that is to recite the Holy Kaddish, the prayer for the soul of the departed, which must be recited by a living close friend or relative, and preferably every morning for a year, and that's what I'll be doing. And I'll be doing it in memory of the great Sadiq for his soul. So... Leonard Cohen. Leonard. Yiskadavi Yiskadash me rabo. Bo modivro chirusevi amlek machuse. Bechai chon of yome chon of chaye de chol beis Yisrael. Bagalot of Isman kori vimro amen. Yehesh me rabo me merach leilo mo meo maya. Yisparach vi yishtabach vi yispa'av vi yisamam. Vis na sevia sadavia salavia salal shmed kucho, berichu. Le lobin berichosa vishirosa tushpichosa. Damiron bomo vimru amen. Yehe shlomo rabba min shamaya vachainu lenu vial ko yisrael vimru amen. O se shalom vimramov. Hu ya a se shalom. O lenu vial ko yisrael vimru amen. Well, Go now, go in peace. Our program is ended for this morning. When you go through the world today, I beg you, do not follow the world. Do not follow another person. For the love of God, do not follow your own ego especially. But listen for and follow the Holy Spirit who has come awaken you this morning, whether you realize it or not, by listening to to this broadcast, listening to the words of the Holy Spirit coming at you over waves of energy.